Hi guys, I just finished reading this book. It's called Small Great Things by the author Jodi Pickled. And it was such a great book. This is, the I think, the second book of hers that I've read. The first one was My Sister's Keeper. And I remember crying so much when I read that book. So when I saw this book at the bookstore, I was like, Jodi Pickled, I remember that name. I'm gonna try it out. I finished this book in about 13 hours. It's so great. So this is another One Woman's Toastmaster. If you don't know what Jodi Pickled looks like, she looks like that. I'm going to read the summary for you guys and then I wanna read her author's note. Ruth Jefferson, a labor and delivery nurse, begins a routine checkup on a newborn, only to be told a few minutes later that she's been reassigned to another patient. The parents are white supremacists and don't want Ruth, who is African American, to touch their child. The hospital complies, but the next day, the baby goes into cardiac distress while Ruth is alone in the nursery. Does she obey orders or does she intervene? Ruth hesitates before per um, Ruth hesitates before performing CPR and, as a result, is charged with a serious crime. Charged with a serious crime. Kennedy McQuarrie, a white public defender, takes her case, but Kennedy insists that mentioning race in the courtroom is not a winning strategy. Conflicted by Kennedy's counsel, Ruth tries to keep life as normal as possible, especially for her teenage son. And as the trial moves forward, Ruth and Kennedy come to see what um, Ruth and Kennedy come to see that what they've been taught their whole lives about others and themselves might be wrong. Wow, like my heart just did a little shiver right now just because it's such a powerful book. Um, you read this book through whew, uh, through the perspective of three different people. You get Ruth, the African American labor and delivery nurse. Kennedy, who is the white public counsel, and Kennedy is um, a unisex name, but in this book, she's a female. And then you also get um, the dad, uh, the white supremacist dad. His name is Tucker, Tucker something. Oh, sorry, his name is not Tucker. His name is Turk. Tucker is the name of um, a character in Baby Daddy, a TV show. Okay, so you get those three. I think this book does a great job of highlighting the nuances about race. I found that I related a lot to both female characters, Ruth and Kennedy. And so, uh, it is a very good book. Okay, author's note. About four years into my writing career, I wanted to write a book about racism in the U about four years into my writing career, I wanted to write a book about racism in the United States. I was drawn by the real life event in New York City when a black undercover police officer was shot in the back multiple times by white colleagues. In spite of the fact that the undercover cop had been wearing what was called the color of the day, a wristband meant to allow officers to identify those who were in hiding. I started the novel, foundered, and quit. I couldn't do justice to the topic somehow. I didn't know what it was like to grow up black in this country, and I was having trouble creating a fictional character that rang true. Flash forward 20 years. Once again, I desperately wanted to write about racism. I was uncomfortably aware that then white authors talked about racism in fiction. It was usually historical. And again, what right did I have to write about an experience I had not lived? However, if I had written only what I knew, my career would have been short and boring. I grew up white and class privileged. For years, I had done my homework and my research using extensive personal interviews to channel the voices of people I was not. Men, teenagers, suicidal people, abused wives, rape victims. What led me to write those stories was my outrage and my desire to get those narrative, uh, to give those narratives airtime, so that those who hadn't experienced them became more aware. Why was writing about a person of color any different? Because race is different. Racism. Uh, because race is different. Racism is different. It's fraught. It's hard to discuss, and so as a result, we often don't. Then I read a news story about an African-American nurse in Flint, Michigan. She had worked in labor and delivery for over 20 years, and then one day a baby's dad asked to see her supervisor. He requested that this nurse and those who looked like her not touch his infant. He turned out to be a white supremacist. The supervisor put the patient request in the file, and a bunch of African-American personnel sued for discrimination and won. But it got me thinking, and I began to weave a story. I knew that I wanted to write from the point of a 
uh, from the point of view of a black nurse, a skinhead father, and a public defender. A woman who, like me, and like many of my readers, was a well-intentioned white lady who would never consider herself to be a racist. Suddenly, I knew that I could and would finish this novel. Unlike my first aborted foray, I wasn't writing it to tell the people of color what their own lives were like. I was writing to my own community, white people, who can very easily point to a neo-Nazi skinhead and say he's a racist, but who can't recognize racism in themselves. Truth be told, I might as well have been describing myself not so long ago. I'm often told by readers how much they've learned from my books, but when I write a, but when I write a novel, I learn a lot as well. This time though, I was learning about myself. I was, I was exploring my past, my upbringing, my biases, and I was discovering that I was not as blameless and progressive as I had imagined. Most of us think the word racism is synonymous with the word prejudice, but racism is more than just discrimination based on skin color. It's also about who has institutional power. Just as racism creates disadvantages for people of color that makes success harder to achieve, it also gives advantages to white people that makes success easier to achieve. It's hard to see those advantages, much less own up to them. And that, I realized, was why I had to write this book. When it comes to social justice, the role of the white ally is not to be a savior or a fixer. Instead, the role of an Instead, the role of the ally is to find other white people and talk to make them see that many of the benefits they've enjoyed in life are direct results of the fact that someone else did not have the same benefits. I began my research by sitting down with women of color. Although I knew that peppering people of color with questions is not the best way to educate oneself, I hoped to invite these women into a process, and in return they gave me a gift. They shared their experiences of what it really feels like to be black. I imagine so grateful <laughs> I'm, I'm just I don't know why I'm so emotional but whew, I am okay I, rem I remain so grateful to these women not just for tolerating my ignorance but for being willing to teach me then I had the pleasure of talking to Beverly Daniel Tatum former president of Spelman College and a renowned racial uh renowned 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 racial educator i read books by dr tatum debbie irving michelle alexander and david shipler i enrolled in a social justice workshop called undoing racism and left in tears every night as i began to peel back the veneer of who i thought i was from who i truly am then i met with two former skinheads to develop a vocabulary of hate for my white supremacist character my daughter, Sammy, was the one who found Tim Zhao, a former skinhead who had Skyped with her in high school. Years ago, Tim left up, oh, sorry. Years ago, Tim beat up and left a gay man for dead. And after getting out of the movement, he started to work at the Simon Wiesenthal Center talking about hate crimes and realized one day that the man he had nearly killed worked there too. There were apologies and forgiveness, and now there are friends who talk about their unique experiences to groups every week. He also is happily married now to a Jewish woman. Frankie Mink, for another former skinhead, works with the Anti-Defamation League. Although, although he once recruited for a hate cruise in Philly, he now runs Harmony Through Hockey, a program to promote racial diversity among kids. These men taught me that white power groups believe in the separation of the races and think they are soldiers in a racial holy war. They explained how recruiters for hate groups would target kids who are bullied, marginalized, or who came from abusive homes. They'd distribute anti-white flyers in a white neighborhood and see who responded by saying that the whites were under attack. Then they'd approach those folks and say, you're not alone. The point was to redirect the recruits' rage into racism. Violence became a release, a mandate. They also taught me that they also taught me that now most skinhead groups are not crews seeking out violence, but rather individuals who are networking underground. Nowadays, white supremacists dress like ordinary folks. They blend in, which is a whole different kind of terror. When it came to title this book, I found myself struggling again. Many of you who are longtime fans of mine know this was not the original not the original name of the novel. Small Great Things is a reference to a quote often attributed to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. If I cannot do great things, I can do small things in a great way. But as a white woman, did I have the right to paraphrase these sentiments? But as a white woman, did I have the right to paraphrase these sentiments? Many in the African American community are sensitive to white people using Martin Luther King Jr.'s words to reflect their own experience and with good reason. However, I knew 
I also knew that both Ruth and Kennedy have moments in this novel where they do a small thing that has great and lasting repercussions for others. Plus, for many whites who are just beginning to travel the path of racial self-awareness, Dr. King's words are often the first step of the journey. His eloquence about a subject most of us feel inadequate putting into words is inspiring and humbling. Moreover, although individual changes cannot completely eradicate racism, there are systems and institutions that need to be overhauled as well. It is through small acts that racism is both perpetuated and partially dismantled. For all of these reasons, and because I hope it will encourage people to learn more about Dr. King, I chose this title. Of all my novels, this book will stand out for me because of the sea change it inspired in the way I think about myself, and because it made me aware of the distance I have yet to go when it comes to racial awareness. In America, we like to think that the reason we have had success is that we worked hard or, you, or we were smart. Admitting that racism has played a part in our success means admitting that the American dream isn't quite so accessible after all. Um, isn't quite so accessible to all. A social justice educator named Peggy McIntosh has pointed out some of these advantages. Having access to jobs and housing, for example. Walking into a random hair salon and finding someone who can cut your hair buying dolls, toys, and children's books that feature people of your race, getting a promotion without someone suspecting that it was due to your skin color, asking to speak to someone in charge and being directed to someone of your race. When I was researching this book, I asked white mothers how often they talked about I asked white mothers how often they talked about racism with their children. Some said occasionally, some admitted they never discussed it. When I asked the same question of black mothers, they all said every day. I've come to see that ignorance is a privilege too. So what have I <clears throat> So what have I learned that is helpful? Well, if you are white like I am, you can't get rid of the privilege you have, but you can use it for good. Don't say I don't even notice race like it's a positive thing. Instead, recognize that differences between people make it harder for some to cross a finish line and create fair paths to success for someone uh, for everyone that accommodate those differences. Educate yourself. If you think someone's voice is being ignored, tell others to listen. If you think um, if your friend makes a racist joke, call him out on it instead of just going along with it. If the two former skinheads I met can have such a complete change of heart, I feel confident that ordinary people can too. I expect pushback from this book. I will have people of color challenging me for choosing a topic that doesn't belong to me. I will have white people challenging me for calling them out on their racism. Believe me, I didn't write this novel because I thought it would be fun or easy. I wrote it because I believed it was the right thing to do, and because the things that make us most uncomfortable are the things that teach us what we all need to know. As Roxana Robinson said, a writer is like a tuning fork. We, we respond when we are struck by something. If we're lucky, we'll transmit a strong, pure note, one that isn't ours, but which passes through us. To the black people reading small great things. <laughs> I hope I listened well enough to those in your community who opened their hearts to me to be able to represent your experiences with accuracy. And to the white people reading small great things, we are all works in progress. Personally, I don't have the answers and I'm still evolving daily. There is a fire raging and we have two choices. We can turn our backs or we can try to fight it. Yes, talking about racism is hard to do and yes, we stumble over the words. But we who are white need to have this discussion among ourselves. Because then, even more of us will overhear, and I hope the conversation will spread. <sighs> Jody Pickled, March 2016. Holy crap, I didn't expect um, to have such a strong reaction to this book. I think this, this transcends um, people of different races. This just like brings me back to... Um, Rupal, who I met in Denver. So Rupal and I talked very long about um, America, races, the caste system in India, uh, the history of India. I think that's why this hits such a strong note for me. Because no matter where you are, no matter what country you grew up in, what country you live in, this is, this is somehow applicable to you. This is, it's either, you're either on the side of Ruth, the nurse, or um, Kennedy, the good, well-intentioned white public defender, or you may be Turk. Wow, this book is going to, 
I'm gonna send this book off to another person to read and I hope that the book hit them as much as it hit me. Yeah. Yeah, I'll talk to you guys next time.